What is up YouTubes and MTG financiers? You got questions around when to buy or sell cards that are standard legal, maybe just cards from the newest set? I'm gonna look at some fancy charts, see if we can find some answers. Let's get into it. So standard sets are the standard blocks. Well, not blocks. Those are gone from standard. I mean, some are still in standard, but none after this most recent set. Yeah, like they were gone before, then they came back, now they're gone again. Love the consistency. Regardless, the definition of standard really hasn't changed. It's a format that only allows you to play cards from sets that are really in the last two years, not including like specialty sets or master sets. Just go to whatsinstandard.com and see for yourself. In this video, we're gonna go through what is currently in standard as of, what is it, May 2018. So we got the Kaladesh block. Kaladesh, which includes Kaladesh and Aether Revolt. Amonkhet block, which is Amonkhet and Hour of Devastation, the Ixalan block, which is Ixalan and Rivals of Ixalan, and Dominaria, which is just a big, cool set where we return to the motherland of magic. Now, I'm sure we've all been at a pre-release and heard this kind of conversation. Hey, man, how did your, how'd your pre-release go? Man, my pre-release was great. I got the best card in the entire set. What? Amazing. Look at this thing. Everyone wants it. There's buyouts everywhere. Paid for my pre-release, no problem. Oh, wow, nice pull. Did you try and sell it at the pre-release? Well, no, I didn't I didn't sell it yet. I mean, this, this card's gonna be played in every format. There's no way I'm gonna sell it yet. I wanna wait and see how high it actually gets. Let's say we had to give this person some kind of advice or we're seeing a Reddit thread where shockingly someone has asked, should I sell this card right now? And 99% of the time we're gonna hear or read you should have sold it the day it came out. If the set didn't come out today, you should have sold it yesterday. Generally speaking, the reason for that logic or that answer is because in standard, we know cards have a timeline for which they are legally playable, meaning this is probably the time when their playability is the highest because they can be played in so many formats. So once they rotate out of a format, their playability is going to drop, their demand's gonna drop, and more likely than not, the price will drop. Now, where I started on the analysis for this video was just looking at full set values. Because if we can see if the full set is moving up or down, at least we can get a general idea for when the cards will do the same. I got all my prices off of MTG Goldfish because I just liked their interface. Feel free to find your own sources. We also have to note that none of these charts include masterpieces because those are technically different sets. They're not standard legal. They're not involved with this video at all, other than to tell you they're not involved. You get it. All right, let's get into our first chart. Finally, the oldest set in standard, that would be Kaladesh. But what do we see here? We see the blue line, which is obviously the change in price. We can see the set symbols, which is when sets were actually released. What is this chart telling us? So this chart is showing us there's a small spike before the set is actually released. Then there's another spike shortly after the release. I'm, I'm gonna say it's safe to assume that these spikes are coming because of the GPs and pros events really showing, hey, look, these new cards are playable. Here's what's made top eight decks. You know, there's some slight drops and pickups before the release of other sets. Generally though, this chart is showing a steady decline since its release. The chart's showing a pre-release hype price, PHP, for non-programmers, I suppose, but a pre-release hype price of over 300 bucks. It dropped to just over 200 over the course of three months, not the best of signs. And we can see now it's at a whopping 166 bucks and change. So close to a loss of 50% of its pre-release hype price. Here's a, the revolts chart. We see a lot of the similarities to Kaladesh, a spike price during the pre-release spoiler season, vendors pre-selling cards, and then a decline after the pre-release, then little daggers drops pickups, overall steady decline in value. This set looked like it was pushing over $350 for the whole set and actually had a higher pre-sale price than Kaladesh. Now it's worth about 140 bucks. Moving on to the next block, Amonkhet. Let's look at this fancy, we're going to Egypt set. Well, it appears we are seeing the same pattern with regards to the whole set's value. The pre-release hype price spike is alive and well, but it doesn't appear to be as dramatic for Amonkhet as it was for the Kaladesh block. We also don't see as obvious a bump up in price following the release, nothing major. But the overall drop in value is not as steep either. Uh, Amonkhet was over $300 pre-sale time, right around that $300 market release, and now it's just over $190 for the whole set. Granted, it also hasn't been out for as long, so it would be interesting to keep an eye on if the trend continues where it drops, 
if this setter block is maybe stronger than the Kaladesh block. Both blocks, Kaladesh and Emoncat, rotate out at the same time, so that shouldn't cause much of a difference. Time will tell. Let's look at Hour of Devastation. What do we see? More of the same. We see Nicobolus, or Batman, making an appearance in the pre-release hype price with that double spike action. We see a seemingly well-established trend where the pre-release hype prices are a decent amount above the actual value of the set at release. There's a slight bump, but overall a pretty consistent decline. Something else to point out, um, the second set of these blocks are smaller sets by about 30%, give or take. But unlike Aether Revolt, which was over $350 at pre-release, Hour of Devastation was barely over $250. Now today they're within a dollar of each other, and that might be because Hour of Devastation has been out for a year less. There's definitely important facts or factors we can't weigh at the moment. The point is, none of these sets seem to be remarkably different from one another. Alright, what about the Ixalan block? I mean, Egypt's cool, mummy zombies were cool, but dinosaurs. I mean dinosaurs. Looking at Ixalan, we see what we've been seeing with every other set. Pre-release spike, albeit the highest at just under $400, so that was pretty impressive to see. Again, the small bump shortly after release into an overall steady trend downward and a stabilizing or slight increase after Rivals of Ixalan. Now this set hasn't even been out for a full year, and apparently it's already lost 25% of its value. Great. What about Rivals? Which, remember, is a smaller set. Rivals has 203 cards, Ixalan 272. But that pre-release spike is almost the exact same as where Ixalan was pre-release hype price-wise, just below the $400 line. At release, it looks like it was right around 250 So this set spiked pretty hard come pre-release time. And since release, it's had a slow decline over the past four months, only dropped about 20% of its value down to about 192 bucks and change. And then last, but certainly not least, is Dominaria. We only have weeks of data because Dominaria's only been out for weeks. It's not gonna tell us a whole lot, but there are a few factors to mention around Dominaria before we get into it. The first being, this is the true 25th anniversary set. So this set has had as much hype as any set ever. Number two, it was also accidentally spoiled, meaning we didn't have a week or two to really understand, oh, here's all the new cool cards. We've had over a month, which is a shame that it made us forget about Masters 25 so quickly. And the third point I'll bring up is that Dominaria was not a part of a block. So I think it's not a, a stretch to think that there's more powerful cards in this set because they don't have to be spread across multiple sets in a block. It also had a legend working on it. He's kind of important to the game of Magic. But we do see a steady decline from when stuff was announced to the actual pre-release. And we can see the value is also quite high. Definitely the highest of any of the standard sets at almost 600 bucks for the entire set. And it settled around 375, which is still the highest at release for any of the standard sets. It's gonna be hard to apply the standard price pattern we saw with the previous six sets to Dominaria because of those unique factors. All we can do is speculate now on if it will follow the trend of losing significant value in three to six months, or if it breaks the mold, or if it continues to maintain or increase in value. We know Dominaria is different prior to its release, but is it different post-release? That's what I'm really curious about, and of course, time will tell. I mean, a great sign would be that this set doesn't lose 25% of its total value over the next three to six months. Like, it only losing 10% value would be a massive gain and you're still losing 10% of the cards overall, the set's overall value. For a set's value to actually rise over that three to six month time span seems near impossible looking at least at the current standard sets. So back to our question of our friend who got the best card at the pre-release, when should he sell it? We would be remiss if we didn't tell him you should have sold it at the pre-release. If we just use the data based on the overall set values for every standard set, there's no reason to think this one is going to be any different. Sell it yesterday. But wait, 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 wait. I pulled the most expensive card of the set at the pre-release. Okay, we can't just look at the whole set. I mean, this card is different than the overall value. You need to figure out when should I sell this specific card. Okay, thanks. Is it worth looking at individual card trends? Sure, let's, let's do it. Jumping back to Kaladesh, We'll look at its most expensive card. I'm only going to look at the most expensive card. I know it's not the most complete data set. Anyway, 
Kaladesh, most expensive card is unsurprisingly Chandra, Torch of Defiance. Now we can see, barely, that Chandra was pushing $50 at pre-release. That's not too shabby, not too shabby at all. And then within two months, it had fallen about 60% down to 20 bucks. Rose back up, scratching at that $40 mark, and then through Ixalan has been steadily declining into Dominaria's release. It's still holding strong at over 20 bucks, but it would appear the best time to buy her was within that November to December time frame just after it was released, and then selling her a year later at about double the price. Interesting trend, definitely different than the sets, not quite as consistent or smooth, but let's just see if this holds true moving forward. Next up is Aether Revolt's Challenger Walking Ballista, which what? Wait, is this chart upside down? It shows the price went down after its first announcement, and then shot up after the release. What? Is this a card where you you would have been better buying it off during hype season? No. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I mean, it it's near fifteen bucks, and now it's it's over fifteen bucks. I mean, it's dipped and doozied. Wow, I think we have our first example of a card you would have been better buying off the week leading up to it being released versus trying to find a dip. Next up, we got Amonkhet. Its best card, no surprise here either, is Hazaret the Fervent. Now you can see the initial price. It looks to be around that $20. It plummets to below $5. It's a sub $5 card that you'd be pretty happy to have bought anytime around the release or pre-release because it seems to be trending down now, but you would have had plenty of time to dump this card for a decent profit. All right. Individual cards are seeming to have definite exceptions to the overall set rule of losing value. What about Hour of Devastation? We got the most expensive card, Hollow One. Just kidding, Scarab God. Duh. Duh. Here's another case of it being clearly undervalued at pre-release and then going on a constant and pretty dramatic climb up over 45 bucks after Ixlon was released, and it steadily declined from there. Now, Ixlon's most expensive card, Carnage Tyrant, which my fiance loves to play against me in her dino deck because Blue can't say nope to this guy. This card appears to have been released and folks were like, man, oh, this is kind of good. And it went from 10 to 30 bucks before the set even dropped. Then it steadily declined into the mid to high teens, going into the release of Rivals. It is now back to over 20 bucks. But I think we're starting to see a trend here of cards that start high versus start low. That's definitely looking a little interesting. How about Rivals of Ixalan? Well, our card here, Rekindling Phoenix, it was another one in that $5 to $10 range right away, but then shot up to around $30 when Masters 25 was released. What set? What? I don't remember. And last but not least, we have our good friend that I hurt, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Someone who is definitely worth their weight in gold or silver. At least silver. So this card was immediately seen as valuable in that 35 and above range. He has really not gone down. He's actually risen. There's a lot of debates that he's a staple in more eternal formats. So that'll definitely help his value if he proves to be that valuable. Again, time will tell. So what can we say? Like, what did we... Did we actually learn anything? Can we derive any valuable information from these charts? I would say looking at average set prices and seeing the standard price pattern, there's no way that anyone can really make an argument that holding on to standard cards in general is a good idea. I also don't see a good argument for holding on to standard sealed product because if the whole set just continues to drop in value, that means the EV is going to drop. Doesn't seem like a good place to be dropping a lot of money. It also makes it really obvious why LGS's online merchants are happy to pre-sell cards during spoiler season. But that's not to say there's no opportunities for people that are buying or holding on to cards around the pre-release set release time. Like we saw, there are times when you can buy cards at pre-release prices and those are by far the best time to buy those cards. But I did find it interesting that a majority of the cards, a strong majority of the cards that are doing better after the release and beyond started in that five to ten dollar range so that's definitely something to keep in mind maybe do a deeper dive into seeing how consistent that really is but it seems like if you're buying a card at a high value like 50 60 bucks like chandra 
man, you just you got a long way to fall and a really tough climb to get anywhere near a decent profit on a card like that, which seems kind of obvious when you think about it for more than 12 seconds. Wizards is in no way incentivized to underprint sets. That's basically them leaving money on the table. They've got a public corporation owning them. They got shareholders and they're always super friendly and understanding. And then there's wizards potentially reprinting cards. And this is just another obstacle for standard cards that need to climb over in the long term. So yeah, all of that was to say, if someone asked me today, where would I put my money in magic? It would n it'd be nowhere near standard. If you have something that has value today that you're not playing with, that you don't want, that you have no use for, you're just thinking, oh, I'll sell it when I get around to it. Sell it today. The risk is just all too apparent. It's too consistent, it's too constant, it's too inevitable. But to counter that, I wanna be fair, I don't wanna seem like too biased or preachy about it. You know, this is only light digging. I just looked at overall set values and then the top card. That's That was it. So if you really are having questions, you're trying to figure this out, this data for standard cards is not hard to find. And I really am interested to see how Dominaria impacts or affects other standard sets and how the new model of no longer having blocks and just doing like a major set and then maybe a core set throughout the year, how that impacts standard card prices. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the video. I really hope you found some value or at least some entertainment in it. And if you did, I would genuinely appreciate it if you would subscribe. It'd make me all warm and fuzzy inside. I'd be all happy. I'd want to comment back and be like, hey, thanks for subscribing. You're awesome. Let's be friends. But like YouTube doesn't let me do that. So that's cool. I guess you can check my other social media stuff. But if there's another topic you're curious about, maybe I can work it into a future video. Let me know in the comments. Let's chat there. I just hope life's treating you well. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. No, not, get out of here.